I got a question for you. What does this city know about luxury? Huh? What does a town that's been to hell and back know about the finer things in life? Well, I'll tell you. More than most. You see, it's the hottest fires that make the hardest steel. Add hard work and conviction and the know-how that runs generations deep in every last one of us. That's who we are. That's our story. Now, it's probably not the one you've been reading in papers, the one being written by folks who've never even been here and don't know what we're capable of. Because when it comes to luxury, it's as much about where it's from as who it's for. Now, we're from America, but this isn't New York City, or the Windy City, or Sin City, and we're certainly no one's Emerald City. city and this is what we do morning glory and evening grace america to you do you remember that ad from super bowl 2011 you will when you open the first few pages of a brand new book once in a great city a detroit story by david marines who joins me now david you were watching that ad in a bar and it got you it sure did. I, I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> yes, I was in New York City, um, and I teared up by the end of that ad. Uh, my wife later said to me, you know, why are you falling for that? They're just selling cars, and Detroit's a mess. But it got me thinking about what Detroit meant to me, and also what it meant to this whole country. To me, I was born there. I lived the first seven and a half years of my life in Detroit, and that ad just went somewhere very deep inside me and got me thinking about what I could do and what I do is right. So I decided to write a book about it. You're the best-selling author of many extraordinary books. And I, I was a little surprised. I met you at Meet the Press a few weeks ago, and I got this book and started to read it, finished it on the plane from D.C. last night, made my notes and said, this is going to surprise a lot of people on how it emotionally grabs them. Maybe you have to be 50 years and older. I'm not sure. You have to have a little Motown in your life that could be at any time in your life. But... If it does, you can't put it down. Have you been hearing that from people? You know, Hugh, this book has resonated very deeply, and not just with people of our, of my, you know, post-war baby boom uh, Motown generation. Uh, somehow, it just came at the right time. So, yes, I am hearing that a lot. It begins, the chronology here you write on page 12 covers 18 months, from the fall of 62 to the spring of 64. Cars were selling at a record pace. Motown yep. was rocking. Labor was strong. People were marching for freedom. The president was calling Detroit a herald of hope. It was a time of uncommon possibility and freedom when Detroit created wondrous and lasting things. But life can be luminous when it is most vulnerable. There was a precarious balance during those crucial months between composition and decomposition, what the world gained and what a city, a great city lost. Even then, some part of Detroit was dying, and that is where the story begins. It begins with something I actually, I'm born in 1956, David. Yep. I'd never heard of the Ford Rotunda until I read Once in a Great City. Never heard of it. Well, so many people had not heard of it, but it was at, you know, during its heyday, it was one of the great uh, tourist attractions in the United States. When, when people came to Detroit to, because of the automobile industry, they'd go to the Ford Rotunda, and it had great displays of the latest cars and of Henry Ford's uh, empire. It was kind of the symbol of, of auto industrial might, but it burned down on November 9th, 1962, and was never replaced, and that's sort of uh, a symbol of, of, of what, was, what was to come. There is so much of the wrecking ball in the first few chapters of Once yeah. in a Great City. The, the Gotham goes down, the, the, Ford, the Cadillac uh, Sheraton goes down, 
All these things are going down. I know Detroit, 80 to 83. That's when I'm in law school at Ann Arbor, and I would oh, okay. go in. I think I told you. I'd yeah. go to Greektown. I'd go to Tiger Stadium. And the Renaissance Center had been built, and that shabby Super Bowl was yep. held. But most of the damage had been done by then. By, by far, absolutely. You know, the study of uh, the book is not, you know, I'm not a financial writer. I'm not trying to pretend I can explain all of the uh, financial parts of the demise of Detroit. But, but what I did notice is that in that period between 62 and 64, so many of the structural, deeper structural problems were already there before the riots of 1967, which certainly accentuated things, and before the, the bloated pensions of, of later years and the municipal corruption. There were th- things stacked against Detroit even uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. It's all in the book, America, whether you love Al Kaline and Alex Karras, whether you're a Motown freak, whether you want to know about JFK at Michigan launching the Great Society, uh, the, uh, the Peace Corps, or LBJ coming back to launch the Great Society there. It's all there, but it begins with an astonishing set of facts. In Detroit, in 1960, there were 1,670,000 people. The city was 28.9% black. It fell by a million people in 50 years, David Marinus. That's, it's a warning to every metropolis in the world, isn't it? It certainly is. I call Detroit sort of an exaggeration of the urban woes of, of so many places in the world. You know, it, it, was, it was hindered by being a one-company town, all dependent on the automotive industry, and that industry turning away from Detroit, uh, both in terms of its factories and sort of emotionally, uh, for various reasons. Uh, I think to its re- regret today, um, but also so many other factors where with the the productive taxpayers leaving the city made it easier by all of the great freeways in Detroit um, and uh, also the unsettling of established African-American neighborhoods through probably well-intentioned urban renewal that, that had the opposite effects. So all of those factors played into to Detroit's demise. But sociologists at Wayne State University in 1963, predicted exactly what was going to happen, sadly. They said it would lose a half million people per decade. Uh, my notes, my margin notes are, wow, 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 quote, productive people who pay taxes are leaving the city, a Wayne State University report, yep. laid it all down. And I think now I live in California now, uh, and I was I was a stepchild of Detroit because I'm from Warren, Ohio. We had a GM Packard plant and a Lordstown sure. plant. And if Detroit caught a cold, we caught a fever, right? And so yep. we were completely dependent on it. And the same thing's happening again. So do you think there's a parable here, or maybe more than a parable, a, a, a cautionary tale for every metropolitan leader? Well, I have two answers to that. One is yes. Um, if we had all of the answers, though, this would be a magical world, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Right. But I think that that one way you can look at it is that whenever a city or an area goes for short-term gain uh, as opposed to long-term stability, it suffers. And I think that happened to a large degree in Detroit. Some of it might have been inevitable, but a lot of it was small decisions that you'll see throughout the book that added up to to trouble. The other uh, positive aspect of it is Detroit hit such a rock bottom that it's coming back. And I was there last week, and the energy was palpable and delightful and there's so many um, young people moving to Detroit now because it's you can start at the bottom and be creative and it's cheap housing and and they're you know they're turning it into I w- would call it the, the new Brooklyn but that but Detroiters don't like to hear that yeah. um, but what, there's what also about the- in the downtown area a lot of investment going in you know uh, rich people gambling on the city again and wanting to to help it succeed so Dan yes, Gilbert very rarely is Detroit, wrong so it's what what's coming now? Yeah, Dan Gilbert is very rarely wrong when he makes a bet. But let me let me remind people, I didn't know this until I read Once in a Great City, a Detroit story, which is linked at HughHewitt.com. Perfect Christmas present, but just read it for yourself. They bid for the 68 Olympics. Talk about hubris. Oh, the man. Detroit well, Olympics. They, they had a shot at it. They, um, well, they came in second. <laughs> they came in second, and they had been the U.S. nominee before that several times. This, they thought, was their time. It the decision was made in 1963. Uh, they lost to Mexico City. And what fascinates me, you know, it's counterfactual history, what if. But there are a lot of what, what ifs in, in life and in, in the story of this city. But what if Detroit had gotten those Olympics? Would, would the uh, powers that be in Detroit have been more sensitive to the problems bubbling up and, and somehow have prevented the riots of 1967? We don't know. Maybe not. But, but it's an interesting to ponder. 
On the other side, what if the Olympics had been held in Detroit in 1968, that, that year of black power when Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists in Mexico City? If that had happened in Detroit, one of the, the heartbeats of African-American life in, a, in the U.S., it could have been quite something. I'm coming right back with David Marinus. His brand new book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story, is linked at HughHewitt.com. You're going to love it. You're going to find it impossible to put down. I'll post the audio of this interview and the entire transcript over at my Facebook page, the Hugh Hewitt public page, but you can go and order the book at HughHewitt.com. Stay tuned. It's Hugh Hewitt, Harvard, Ann- Harvard Art. I can't even say it, David. How do you say Harvard Annie? I, I, you know, I went to Harvard. I should be able to pronounce it. But the band played it when John F. Kennedy blew into town in Detroit in 1962, just as the Cuban Missile Crisis was about to unload on him. And he really, he really thought Michigan was where it all happened for him. It was the center of American political power for a while. Well, you know, traditionally the Democratic candidates for for president would open their their uh, fall campaigns in Detroit in Cadillac Square with uh, Walter Ruther, the United Auto Workers president, at their side. Uh, there's two interesting facts to, to Kennedy's appearance there. One is that it was in in Detroit that he gave sort of the first uh, a variation of his most famous phrase: "The ask not what what your country can do for you." He, he didn't put the ask not at the beginning, but it was the same phrase. And what fascinated me is that not only that famous phrase was uttered first in Detroit, but also Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. He gave that in Detroit before he did it in Washington. So yes, Detroit was sort of the center of not only a lot of things, but some of some great rhetoric. There's also, there's a hint in the book, and I want to tease it out of you. If only they'd left the mob alone. You don't say that, you don't, you don't write that, you don't advocate that, but you're left wondering if they'd only left the Gotham alone and the numbers to be run maybe the city wouldn't have plummeted. Is there, is there some truth to that? Well, I would put that in the what-if category of a lot of other little decisions. You know, whether it was leaving the Gotham alone, I think it's a larger issue of, of respecting traditional communities. And, and Detroit, for a lot of reasons, really didn't consider what would happen if they unsettled the African-American community in Detroit by really, through urban renewal, eliminating a lot of the old Hastings Street neighborhood, the Paradise Valley or Black Bottom, as it was called. And, and the long-term effects of that, I think, were, were much more deleterious than people thought they would be. So the Gotham sort of represents that. It was raided by the police. It was the center of social and cultural life in African-American Detroit, and uh, it was never the same. Let's talk a little bit about Motown and Barry Gordy Jr. You assume that a lot of us who enjoy the music know a lot about Barry Gordy. I don't. I mean, I know about Smokey Robinson and Little Stevie Wonder. And of course, I grew up to the Temptations and Marvin Gaye, but I didn't know how it got started. And it was it's a revelation to me that the Gordy family drew up a contract, put in 800 bucks and the whole family in three years, pumped out music. 22 hours a day. It's a, it's a book within a book, David Marinus. Yeah, the Gordy family was extraordinary. They were entrepreneurs, African-American entrepreneurs, um, sort of uh, started with the Booker T. Washington approach, and Barry Gordy was the best businessman in the family, although he had some sisters who I think are underrepresented in the story as well. But they had the family, the eight siblings and the parents, would vote. They had their own fund, and they'd vote on what to give it to. And they gave eight hundred dollars to Barry Gordy in 1959, and from that seed money, he started the most incredible uh, African American music enterprise in our history, the Motown. Um, and his story, you know, he started on the assembly line in Detroit and really started writing songs there. Uh, and uh, you know, everything about it is kind of really extraordinary. Oh, it's a beautiful little set piece on how his uncle teaches him to play until he gives up because he has his own ideas and he goes forward. But there's another little aspect, which is personal to me. My Chambers is a clerk in, on the D.C. Circuit. We're next to Judge Edwards, uh-huh. the great liberal scion. And I had no idea he had a connection to Motown. I mean, he's just the great liberal judge of the D.C. Circuit. And here yeah. he is connected up to Motown. Well, I didn't know it either until I, I found that out. And I 
you know, he doesn't give interviews, but he talked to me for this book. Um, you know, he's very proud of the fact that he's in D.C. in the circuit in the federal courts and never talks to the press. Uh, but he was a great connection for me. He's the stepson of Esther Edwards, the older sister of Barry Gordy, um, and has a deep connection to Motown. He had his his wedding uh, at Barry Gordy's mansion, his his honeymoon at Barry Gordy's mansion in Bel Air in L.A. Now, you know, there's a movie to be made. I don't know if it's been made on the Motortown Review or the Motown Tour or whatever you want to call it, but it's it's been made in a lot of 70s style, uh, almost famous sorts of things. But did anyone ever try and capture you know, Tom Hanks did it with his 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 movie? But did anyone try and capture the, the African-American experience of Motown going on the road? Um, a little bit. You know, there, there are sort of B-rated movies about the temptations and their demise and rise and fall but but nothing nothing really deeply uh, there's a little bit of it in the very fun uh, motown the musical on broadway which is touring the country now i think um it's discussed a little bit but but you're right just that if you you could do just a documentary on those three months of their first motortown review and it would be quite something uh, Jam and everyone in there now. Uh, Barry Gordy did not go along on the bus. He flew along. He flew. But they were one sort of vast family. And when tragedy occurred on the tour in the South, everyone sucks it up and goes out and performs. It's very moving. Did, was that all told to you first person, or is that well known out there? Well, I, all of my reporting uh, is I start with primary interviews and documents. Uh, I, there's, you know, a few books mention it, but. But uh, I interviewed the people to get my own story. And, uh, no, just think about the talent on that one bus. Little Stevie oh. Wonder at age 12 or 13, uh, Mary Wells, Marvin Gaye, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, the Supremes singing. Uh, they were the opening act. And nobody knew if they were good enough to actually be part of it yet. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was really quite something. Now, in, in terms of when it moved west, when did it end? When did it did it leave? When the riots le- uh, destroyed yes, the it town? Left a year, uh, it left two years after. It was slowly leaving. Marvin uh, uh, Barry Gordy had fallen in love with L.A. a couple of years in the late '60s, and and was determined to to get out of Detroit. And, he, and by '71 and two, they were gone. I say, and you know, sadly, at the end of the book, that virtually every major character or thing in my book either dies or 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 you know is destroyed. Um, you know, Walter Ruther dies in a plane crash. Barry Gordy leaves, and Motown leave L.A. Aretha's father, uh, Aretha Franklin's father, Reverend C.L. Franklin, is another character. Oh, that, that's so sad. Four-year it's, coma? Yeah, a he gets four shot year. and is in a coma for many years. Even the Mustang, in my opinion, got sort of fat and wasn't the same in, in the later 60s and early 70s as it was when it first came out in 64 and a half. Uh, when we come back from break, we're going to talk about, of course, Motor City. Part of the, the whole story of Detroit is the rise. There's very little George Romney, but he does have a few cameos in here. Uh, it's, it's almost at the beginning of his era. The end of his era as a car man, the beginning of his era as a politician, correct, David Marinus? That's right. He'd just taken over as governor of Michigan. But there were, I didn't realize that he had beaten a war hero. And I, I'd read all that stuff, but I didn't realize that it was a war hero that he, that he managed to overcome in 62. Well, you know, in that era, I, I don't think it was, uh, they didn't make as much of a deal out of it one way or the other. Um, Swainson, uh, Governor Swainson didn't make too much of it, and, and there was no effort to, uh, in the modern era, swift boat the guy or whatever. I don't know if they could have. but So because there were so many World War II veterans then, um, it was just sort of uh, part of, you know, it wasn't really part of the political atmosphere. Don't go anywhere, America. I'm coming right back with David Marinus. His new book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit story, is linked over at HughHewitt.com. Go and get it for yourself and for your friends and your family. No matter where you grew up in America, Detroit was part of that growing up, and it still is. And we'll tell you more about it when we return. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Hugh Hewitt's show. 34 minutes after the Air America, it's Hugh Hewitt. Of all the songs of which the backstories are produced in the course of David Marinus's new book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story, this one, written by uh, Barry Gordy, is itself the, the, the best backstory because he wrote it because he was turned down on the dance floor, David Marinus. <laughs> That's right. Do You Love Me by the Contours. Uh, when, when Barry Gordy was a teenager, they'd go to the Greystone Ballroom in, uh, on Woodward Avenue in Detroit, and he kept getting turned down by girls. They wouldn't dance with the guy. Um, so Do You Love Me is sort of his act of, of sweet revenge. You know, now he could, Not only could he dance, but he had... 
he was a success by the time he wrote that song. Now, in the next segment, I want to talk about the the problem of race, which is uh, intertwined in the entire book. But yeah. let me pause for a moment on the joyful side of the city. They are fanatical sports fans. I'm from a Cleveland, NEO, Northeastern Ohio, so I know these people, and they're always wrong. But you talk about Alex Karras and Al Kaline and Gordie Howe and Night Lane Train, and this is a city that loved its sports people, but their sports people loved the mob. It's a fascinating, again, it's a book within a book. Yeah, well, there was, you know, I think that there are connections in a lot of different uh, cities with with uh, the shadier side of life. Uh, Alex Karras, who was a very colorful and interesting and, and iconoclastic uh, human being as well as football player, um, you know, was a part owner in a bar that was very closely connected to the mob, and the, the mob in Detroit had what they called the party bus, a reconfitted uh, city bus that, that they put in a bar, and they'd go around town and pick up prostitutes and had football players, and sometimes even take those football players to away games in, Cle- in your Cleveland. <laughs> oh, I know. There, Cleveland makes a cameo on page 119 because of a rare NFL doubleheader. You yeah. also brought you brought back memories, distant memories of the playoff bowl. I think I think most of us have tried to put that out of our memory. It was such a horrible sports event. But I am curious at what point did when, when they they built the Pistons out of town and they the Tiger Stadium was falling apart. Yep. Did did you see any symmetry between the cities? collapse in its failure to care for its sports institutions? Well, yes. Um, uh, you know, it, it, you never want to make too much out of uh, city uh, stadiums and sports institutions because so often the, the owners, you know, the rich owners, <laughs> try to milk the cities out of it. And, right. but, but nonetheless, I think there is a very important connection, and, and particularly in these old industrial cities like Detroit and Cleveland and Pittsburgh, uh, the, the sports is so central to the sense of self of the place. And, and when the Lions and the, and the Pistons left the city of Detroit, uh, absolutely it had a, a reverberating impact on it. Now, I, I don't know that people will recall, but you, you bring it out through the January 11th, 1963 Life magazine. There was a glow of a new New York. Now, it's almost impossible for people listening today to believe that. David, I mean, did you? I know you spent six and a half years there as a young lad. I had never heard about the Ford Tower, the real Donner and Blix, and you know, I, I don't have any memory of Big yep. Detroit, but but it it must have been immense. Yeah, the glow from Detroit was the cover of uh, Life magazine in July of in January of 1963, and and um, it did seem to be glowing then in all the ways that I write about in the book, uh, particularly the. You know, I start one of the early scenes in the book is the 1962 Detroit Auto Show, which is to Detroit what uh, the Academy Awards are to L.A. or the White House Correspondents Dinner to Washington, and that that, that was a huge deal. And at that um, auto show, they unveiled the 1963 cars, which sold more than any in history. And at the same time, sort of uh, very secretly, Ford Motor Company was and the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency were jointly planning the creation and the marketing of the Mustang, the, the sexy car of the 60s. So it, it was a, a boom time in Detroit. Uh, oh, you're, you're, you're backstage at the show. Has the show come back, uh, David Marinus? It, it, there's still a show, right? There is still but, a I don't show, know, it... and yes, it is, come, it is coming back, um, particularly in the last couple of years, you know, <laughs> when the industry came back a little bit. Um, yeah, I, and, you know, I, I, as I said, I was just in Detroit, and and it was far more than the uh, auto industry now. It's no longer um, as dependent on one industry as it used to be because because of Dan Gilbert and so many others who are, who are either the, the you know the big money boys who are gambling on the downtown or the or the kids who are flooding into the midtown area. And how are the suburbs doing? You know, I, my first race I ever ran was in Mount Clemens, which was always an auto worker town. It's what I was in law school. It's probably a 1981 race, something like that. Are they seconds. coming back as well? Well, it depends on what suburbs you're talking about. Uh, Warren, Mount Clemens. I mean, Highland Park is one of the saddest places in the world, uh, huh. which is, you huh. know, uh, outside of Detroit. But it, it's so bad that it has a worse school system than the Detroit itself. Uh, wow, that but, is bad. I'll be right back with David Marinus. We're talking about Once in a Great City, a Detroit story. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. Stay tuned. I don't like you, but I love you. Seems that I'm always thinking of you. Oh, you treat me badly. I love you, man. 
Books in a Great City, a Detroit story by David Marinus and bookstores now available at Amazon.com. Hi, it's Hugh Hewitt. My earlier interview with Chris Christie, which is making some waves, is linked and posted over to HughHewitt.com. Keeping an eye on breaking news. Terrible flooding in South Carolina. Going to continue throughout the night. Hopefully they will get everyone out of harm's way. Nikki Haley doing a wonderful job. And, of course, the conversation goes on as it did all weekend long about Oregon. But I'm pausing for a moment to talk about one book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit story by David Marinus, because it caught my imagination on so many levels. It's from 62 to 64 and maybe the hinge. A lot of us think of 67, 68 of the hinge. David Marinus has written about that. I'm going to come back to that in the last segment. But on the day that Kennedy killed, Aretha Franklin is shopping. This wonderful Bob Anthony character that you come up with is cleaning incinerators. Gordy is yelling at Marvin Gaye, don't you realize the president's been killed? And it's kind of a moment in time where the tumble begins, um, David Marinus. Yes, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of those sorts of forebodings in this book, and, and certainly Kennedy's assassination is is one of them. And there were, there were many more connections to Detroit than I and I realize, you know, the, including the fact that the car that Kennedy was assassinated in was, was you know, came out of Detroit, of course. It was a yep. Ford uh, limousine, and, and went, now it's back at Greenfield Village, kind of eerily. Um, the, one of, uh, you know, w- one of my favorite uh, moments, in, or sort of weird moments in that whole thing is uh, that Jack Ruby's brother lived in Detroit. You know, the guy who killed Lee Harvey Oswald ran right. dry cleaners in Detroit, and that a, a reporter from the Detroit News uh, kit was one of the pallbearers at Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, forlorn funeral uh, in, down in, in the Dallas area. Yeah, and d- just three or four years ago, I stopped coming back from a, a law school reunion at Greenfield Village. My wife didn't actually believe it existed. It was empty. I mean, just completely empty, and it's still an amazing place. But what I wanted to at- do in this segment, Chapter 7, Reverend Klieg does not want to be with the Reverend C.L. Franklin, who's Aretha's father, or with Martin Luther King. He wants to be with Malcolm X. He's an Oberlin man. That, by the way, is where my dad and brother went. He, he, he went to the U of M Law School. He is really a divider in a city that is dividing along race in a way that every city in America divided within the black community along race, and you captured it very nicely in this book. It's, you know, it's, a, it's 1963. Um, as the decade progresses, those divides within the African-American community get wider and wider and, and more... Uh, problematic in terms of uh, the civil rights movement. Um, so, uh, you know, I see it as another breaking point, in a sense. Reverend Clegg was a very charismatic preacher, as was uh, Aretha's dad, uh, C.L., probably the, the most uh, flamboyant and colorful preacher in Detroit. Um, but Franklin was trying to organize a, a, a rally for Martin Luther King that would bring everybody together. And, in fact, he succeeded. It was, it was a remarkably peaceful event, that brought 150,000 people walking down Woodward Avenue to the Cobo Hall where Martin Luther King gave his early version of I Have a Dream. But, but Reverend Clegg didn't want Walter Ruther, the UAW president, to be marching there, or the, the mayor of Detroit, Jerome Cavanaugh. He didn't want any white representation. Um, and that really sort of, he was more attuned with Malcolm X and the black power movement at that point, and it would only get more pronounced as the decade went on. Now, what was that moment, which is basically uh, we'll do it ourself moment, uh, yes. black identity moment, was that replicated in other places or is it unique to Detroit? Oh, no, it was replicated almost in every, uh, both in the North and the South. You know, not that much longer after that, you had H. Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael and, and SNCC turning, you know, SNCC, with the, the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had started um, as a very integrated movement with a lot of rights right. from the North coming down to, to work on it. And, and very soon after that, it became, you know, representative of black power and a very different sensibility. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out where it started. And I, I really, this is early. This yeah, is really you know, an early indication it, of it. I would say it started in Detroit. It's certainly Mel, uh, Malcolm X in, in New York City uh, and, and the, and the um, and Chicago and and. and you know, I think it was, I think it was sort of uh, spontaneously happening at a lot of places at about the same time. But but certainly Detroit represented that in a very profound way that that summer. And when did the drugs arrive? Once in a great city, a Detroit story doesn't really give you know, much time to it. Well, and I'm wondering when right. they arose. 
there were, certainly were drugs in Detroit then. There was heroin and um, and other drugs. But I think that the, the, the real large movement of drugs started probably in the later 60s and certainly deeply into the 70s. It was so out of control. And so what was the city's relationship with the rest of the state? Again, Detroit was a place you'd go to if you were in Ann Arbor for a night or, or a weekend. It, it was a place to go and come back from not to stay or to drive through on your way to somewhere else up to the lawyer, uh, you, know, you know, up to the oop, whatever you're going. Yep. When did that disconnect occur? Well, I think in the period that I'm writing about, it wasn't as pronounced as it certainly would become. You know, the dividing, the traditional dividing line are the riots of 1967. And I think that's the most pronounced uh, differentiation. It certainly was occurring over a period of, you know, things don't happen just, um, you know, uh, spontaneously. So over the course of probably the, starting in the late 50s, I would say, and then most pronounced by the riots of 67. And did did Vietnam and the fact that McNamara, I love that pull up your socks kind of guy <laughs> anecdote, by the way. I mean, that's really a telling anecdote. How much does McNamara's run of the war cast a shadow on Detroit? That's reaching, I know, liter- for a literary connection, but right. his methods became the methods of Vietnam. Yes, they did. Um, that he learned at the, you know, that he imposed at the Ford Motor Company um, fairly successfully, sort of the turning everything into analytics and numbers and and uh you know i, I don't i don't i don't have a i'm not a i'm also not a, i can't claim to be an expert on cars I, I do know a lot about vietnam i wrote a book about that too but but i think that that sort of mcnamara's sensibility um certainly um carried over from the ford motor company to the pentagon and not and not for the better Not for the better. I'll be right back. One more segment in today's show with David Marinus. His great new book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story, is linked at HughHewitt.com. Stay tuned. Nothing you can take can tear me away from my God. Nothing you can do. 55 minutes after the hour, America. If you want to read the story about Mary Wells and my guy, you're going to have to read the book, Once in a Great City, a Detroit Story. It's linked at HughHewitt.com by David Marinus, associate editor at the Washington Post, author of many great bestsellers. Once in a Great City is, I hope somebody's inspired to do the same thing for Cleveland, but I don't think it's got the same kind of Shakespearean arc to it. Uh, a closing question, David Marinus. It's a short segment. Uh, President Kennedy launched the Peace Corps at U of M. LBJ went back and he launched the Great Society. Now, the Peace Corps is not a failure. And, you know, right. My college roommate, Mark Guerin, ran it for a while. It, it's done great work, but the Great Society failed. Tom Hayden launched the SDS out of Michigan and Port Huron. It failed. They all failed. Did Michigan give up the essential element of its greatness, which was capitalism and free enterprise? Is that where it went wrong? Um, I don't know. That, that question is too big for me. You, I mean, to be honest, I, I could give a, a, a superficial answer, but I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, but certainly... I end the book at, with Lyndon Johnson's speech because it's such a wistful moment where the characters in the book don't know what's coming, but we all right. do. And, and, and it is that, that failure to meet the hopes and promises of that moment. Well, you also end with a Venn diagram. It's fascinating. <laughs> uh, this Venn diagram, everybody is connected in a city that works, and no one is connected in a disaster. You know, um, well, they're, they're all part of the disaster in the end, but that, that, that diagram um, was just something I used to help me write the book, and, and my editor saw it and said, let's publish it. <laughs> so, um, you know, Good on him or her. All the characters are pretty strong. And there's a little eulogy section, I won't even call it an epilogue, where you're walking along Woodard Boulevard and it's empty and you could read War and Peace and cross it. Hopefully it doesn't. They've got everything. Right? I don't know if they got the gas that Ohio and Pittsburgh and got, but, but they've got water, right? They still have everything that made it a great city. They do have everything. And, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I've been one my whole life. My, my, my philosophy is be uh, optimistic but always skeptical. And so I'm skeptical, but I do see a lot of energy in Detroit now, right now. And because they had so much, I think they can have some of it back again. 
Well, David Marinus, congratulations. Once in a Great City of Detroit story is in bookstores now. What's next, David? You've got pretty much the 60s covered. I think I'm done with the 60s. You're right, Hugh. So, so where are you waiting for the next president? Is that it? You wrote a book about President yeah, Obama. Maybe There's, so. Maybe so, yeah. All right. If you, if you had to pick one right now who you'd want to write about, I mean, are you up to a Trump biography? No, I, I can't. <laughs> I just can't swallow it. I'm sorry. <laughs> David Marinus, thank you for joining us, America. Don't go anywhere. I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Doctors Without Borders is demanding an investigation at this era. The description of the attack keeps changing. They say the reality is the U.S. dropped these bombs. They want people to look into it. I'll bring you the update on that. And on the race for speaker between Kevin McCarthy, the overwhelming favorite, Jason Chaffetz. Whatever happens overnight, I will tell you about. Do not worry if it happens. You'll hear about it here first on the Hugh Hewitt Show.